those who do not understand equality look at it this way you women you said you are equal to us now you go ahead and do the work that we used to do woman is a sign of endurance whatever the circumstances she will bear the burden Usually use culture whenever it suits them. When they want to, when it is to their advantage, they will say, you know, we have to observe our cultures. The aunt is the one who gives to girls a sex education. In fact, among the Baganda, the aunt accompanies uh, her niece to the home on the wedding day. societies integrate uh, fe femininity with masculinity. The two are combined to make society go ahead. Everything in Buganda worked through a twin system. Okay, they would twin something with something. Most of the time they would twin male and female, feminine and masculine, through most of the rituals. Among the Langi, a man who is not authoritative, a man who cannot make a woman pregnant is considered a woman. A woman who behaves like a man or a woman who is aggressive, who fights, who is always in the public spaces causing trouble is considered a man. So being a woman or womanhood in itself it's not just biological. You do never get a woman who would undermine her husband. The husband was always referred to as the head of the family. The father figure is kind of a, an authority figure. Awesome figure, supposed to be revered, respected, honored and feared. The hard power of the man uh, the rough beat and you obviously know that many times we ex exalt this uh, aspect of strength and power and force. The man has control, the man has the final say, the man is the representation of the community. And so that is what many times catches our attention. Welfare of the family is solely the responsibility of the wife. When it comes to mothering, women are looked at and respected, and that role is looked at, valued much more. Women would know that when it's time for them to sit and discuss things, they sit by themselves and they talk about women's issues, and the men would also sit by themselves and discuss the issues that concern them. Nothing was written in stone, but this sort of informal structure organized the work that women and men did. While for the men, it would require a lot of strength, like opening the land. Women's roles required detail, like when it comes to weeding, they would weed the crops with the hands or sometimes with the, the, the shells of snails. There were clubs uh, in relation to villages, women digging together. So today we go dig for you, following day we dig for another woman. So that way you dig a big piece. Men would go hunting and then women would wait and cook the food at home. But uh, most of the harvesting was also done by the women. Men then played a role in storing food, um, preparing the granary, and then the food would be now stored. But 
keeping that store was also the woman's role. The man did not play that. When I grew up, it's women I saw coming, returning from fields. It's women I saw going to harvest. They, they would work for each other to be able to ease each other's work. I, I look at myself as the principal accountant because if anything went wrong, I would be the one to answer for it. I, I could say, I drive my children in different directions. I'm the one who is besides them throughout their lives. We have so many different forms of families today. In fact, census results show that the biggest growing family arrangement in Uganda is cohabitation. Cohabitees people who are living together but have never formalized their marriages, their relationship. Same-sex families, children-headed families, grandmother-headed families thanks to HIV AIDS, thanks to all the armed conflicts that have killed off people. I mean, there are so many families. Unfortunately, the law recognizes just a few. In my own culture, we have very particular roles for women. Uh, my responsibility is to give the name, to name the children of my brothers and sisters, to give the name. When my brother gives birth to a child, they choose a name and they say, this child is Namoviru. I've given that my daughter this name. Do you approve? I said, that is fine, because I have the memory of the names of my, my lineage. Women could be priestesses, that means they can say things about the present, about the future. As religious leaders, women are never killed. Even in cases where they are suspected of committing apostasy, committing treason, women were never killed. Okay? That's why even in wars with the foreign women who are foreign to, to, to our tribe, they just collected those women and took them home. In the past, they would go and fight wars. Whether a man was not really as courageous as the others, he was really considered to be authoritative, to have strength. There were also strong women in the communities, but that ideology of thinking that men are more important because they are stronger overshadowed these strong women. It was the role of women to pray for the success of the world. In our traditional cultural setup, the, the divinities, we would call the equivalent in English is divinities, embandwa. They are the gods who are masculine and then the goddesses who are feminine. Most of the feminine goddesses are specifically dealing with life sustenance, life preservation, areas of giving birth, areas of medicine, areas of protection. The most authoritative, the most respected religious personage would be a priestess. A priestess is, is a rare occurrence, although in most cases the ones who preside over traditional rituals, I mean ceremonies when they are worshipping, so to say, they are mostly women. And uh, prominent among these is one umbandwa called Kaikara which is responsible for reproduction. And where they are, they are given the highest pedestal. There are times when, there's, when you see a rainbow, you are warned not to go to the river. They are saying that at that moment, the river goddess is giving birth. So you don't dare get anywhere near the river. We grew up knowing that she's capable of making me infertile. And as a young girl, we were told not to urinate near the riverbed because those are the causes of her anger. We are not supposed to shout near the riverbed. Fighting was forbidden like nothing because that one would anger her and it would even bring sickness to you. Can a mother uh, give up on her children? I cannot forget you, Israel. I cannot give up on you. The attributes of God 
communicate effectively when they are related to the women because the women are the best example. I grew up with a father and mother, but if you refer to God as mother, I would easily, quickly have a grasp of what you are talking about. Mother is always present in my life. I would uh, desire to see God much more as a mother figure. Those feminists who would like to tear apart the Bible and write the, rewrite it, I think, miss the point because there are some women who are also as brutal as men there are also some men who are as soft as, as women. In many systems of governance or leadership, the man will be there. But when we come to real life issues, which are usually based on the kinship system, the woman will be a key factor. If in a clan, people are stuck with choosing a hair, it will be the girl children who will sit among themselves and agree. And for me, I understand it because uh, men will ensure that their families, the families to which they, they actually belong, will continue. Women uh, will ensure that uh, uh, the lineage goes on. And I think in our sense, people look further they look further than uh, this small community that you are grounding as your family as a, as a man, and they give this role to, to women. They are given the opportunity to be in charge of deciding who they are should be. We were called to select and to confirm that the person that he has mentioned in his will is the one that we want to carry on the family um, responsibility to become the heir and we needed to confirm yes we agree with that the mother's side was always the side of counsel even when a woman is married when he, she leaves the home her children know that if there are any problems and they have to take refuge somewhere the grandmother is there, the uncles are there. And it so happened that, that the tie was not completely cut off. There was patrilline, but this woman still had a voice somehow. She had a home to run to if something happened. Many deals are done behind the curtain and uh, women have a lot of control although they do not come to the open and although men are not so much willing to disclose that after all uh, it's a woman who has advised or who has made a decision and no wonder in our culture we have a saying that a house literally a house which would imply a family is built by a woman power plays out behind the curtains in most cases. Decisions are made in the bedroom in most cases. There is this traditional cultural understanding. So when you see, when you see a man making a decision, uh, you will come to observe that it could be the woman who is manifesting herself in this case. There is the issue of woman as being the soft power, the moderating factor. Now, as it has always been said, many times we misunderstand gentleness to be a sign of weakness. And so, there is the understanding that a woman may act foolish, and yet she knows what she's up to. So, man is supposed to be very careful and extra vigilant. It's not downplaying the role of the woman. To say that women are really oppressed is uh, to approach these issues from uh, a very mistaken uh, and misinterpreted uh, way. The aspect of bread honor, the magnification of the male power, uh, I, I think also finds its place through borrowing. Be because much of our definition, even of our relationship, is not our definition. Relations in society are much more 
based on uh, how you play out your life with the mother, how you live your life with the mother. The worst would be even a curse from the mother. A, f a father may curse, but the curse may not be as holding or as tough as that of, or, or as that of a mother. A woman at one point belongs to the clan of the father and uh, then to the clan of the husband. So uh, through women, we are taken beyond this idea of limiting yourself to a given clan. The uncle, because he's coming from this side of the woman, that is the side where children are never young. Whoever comes from there, whether he's born today, whether he's 90 years, is an uncle. This is a kind of contradiction. They will tell you a woman does not give birth. Omkazi Tazar, it is a man who gives birth. Now, the giving birth in this case is considered to be the blood lineage, the genealogy, as opposed to the actual act of delivering. The words we use in Luganda for, for birth, we say okuzala. They all go back to something that only women can do. The role that a woman uh, plays in the keeping and even transmission continuity of life is so central that men understand it. I have uncles paternal and uncles maternal, aunties paternal and aunties maternal. If I was to use the aunties for my paternal, I would call her Ise Nkatinyowe. Uh, Ise as derived from father. Uh, ma, my maternal would be Nyinento Nyinento Nyowe. You, you can have a conversation with your uncle on issues to do with sex, mater, maternal uncle. I do not know why it is that, uh, again, the maternal uncles are, are so tight. I mean, we relate with them there is a certain level where they are like your, your brothers. They can play around with you. And it's not supposed to be when it comes to your paternal uncles. According to the culture of the Bamasa, my mother's brother may beat his children, but he cannot dare beat me. He has to treat me with the softness that a mother with me. So in a sense, he is my male mother. My mother gave me names from her own clan. So when I go there, I'm a different creature altogether. They call me by the names of their clan. My father's sister behaves to me differently from the way my mother would behave towards me. The importance they used to attach to the brother, the uncle, the brother of this woman in relation to the children. It was so strong that even when a girl is getting married, the mother's brother has to be there to give his blessing. And he takes a small share of the dowry that is being paid. And when it comes to death, Still, the uncles must be involved when it is um, said things like the barrio. And it was often said that the children belong to the maternal uncle. That is known. When a girl is married, the bride price is given to the father. But the father has to pick one cow and give to the uncles to recognize their role in bringing up, in giving them a wife. So that lineage continues. Uh, first cousins, second cousins cannot marry. Those are your relatives. Meanwhile, on the father's side, it's the whole clan. You can't marry from the clan. When a girl is married, she becomes a woman where she's married. She's a wife and she eventually becomes either grandmother. But on the paternal side where she was born she remains a girl when uh, there are clan issues when there are festivities the girls of the clan are invited 
Those who are married come with their husbands. Those who are not married or those who are separated are more complete girls because they do not have husbands, they do not have other homes. They can even inherit land. But on this piece of land that you own, you cannot bring a man and the man owns. The, la the, the, the property that you're given on the paternal side remains the property on your father's side. And your children are also absorbed. They are called okeo, but okeo means children of our sister from another clan. But eventually, if their father is not really taking care of them, if you're given a piece of land, these children inherit this land that you've been using and no one will chase them away from that. There's this communal and societal respect for women who have twins and they are revered. There's a myth surrounding their presence. In the past, among the Langi, they would put a shrine for this woman and she was more or less looked at as above all mothers because she's the mother of twins. When a man has just married a woman, he can show his manhood and uh, masculinity and so on. As time goes, the woman grows bigger. So if you were a good husband when the kids were growing up, you're a good father to them when they're growing up, you're going to benefit from what they bring. If you are a bad husband and a bad father to them, you'll always or sit around their mother? My father, I would say, was friendly and he would crack a lot of jokes. My mom was a very strict woman, very strict disciplinarian and we knew her. We don't just play any nonsense around her. The center of authority in the home of discipline was really my mother. If you did something and she was not happy with you, she had the very traditional method of disciplining you. She would cane you. My father, I don't remember him even caning me once. My mother was at the same time a working woman. Yeah, she was a very industrious woman. She had a strong background as a nurse. And she also fought. She was a multi-skilled woman. She was a very good teacher of catechesis. She was a nurse. At the same time, she was a tailor. So when she was in the hospital as a nurse, between her jobs, she was also the one tailoring the uniforms for the workers and the patients. And I understand during the night, she would do both brewing of liquor and also go to the garden with the moonlight. Something which people thought was so weird, but she had to make odds meet. Dad and my mother and uh, we, the children, we all used to till that. In fact, it is our dad who always woke up first at 3 a.m. You know he was a, a teacher, but he was also a farmer, kind of a cultivator. And he used to wake up at 3 a.m. to go to the gardens. He was working and he supplementing his uh, mega salary as a primary teacher. We used to grow so much cotton. About three lorries could come for cotton from our family. He was a responsible father. But these days, my brothers leave the women to do everything. They go and get drunk. And they don't even go to the gardens. And the women go and suffer. And the men will come and even take away the little money they get out of their sweat. There is one woman I remember people used to talk about, and she was referred to as Iziago, which means a woman who is man-like. That's what it really means. Because she would do many things which were done by men. For example, you never hear of a, a mad woman climbing to, to touch the house. But this is a woman who knew how to touch the hearts better than even many men. The first mad woman as a bus conductor she was the daughter of a chief, but she did not sit down because she was a princess. She worked very hard. She sat on the bus every day, traveling from Moyo to Kampala, Kampala to Moyo. 
and the bus was called the France Nile. She was widowed when she was a very young mother, but she worked very hard brewing waragi, and she educated all her children, all her children using waragi. Because as a young woman, she was very industrious, and the other men were interested in her getting remarried. She refused to be convinced to be remarried. She dedicated her life to her children. Mama Ataka was a businesswoman because she was the one who was steering the family. And up to today, people refer to the family as Ataka's children. So the first woman parliamentarian from Moyo is her daughter, another son who was also a member of parliament, as well as a minister. Economically, times are tough for both men and women. So those so-called traditional roles, gender roles, where the woman is supposed to remain in the home and look after the home and the man is supposed to go out and earn a living and you know buy everything in the home. Those days are long, long, long gone. I'm a police driver. I'm married with one kid. I normally drive this lead cars for leading important people. This is my eighth year driving it. I had interest in it. I went for training. I passed the training. I started driving. And so far, I'm the only lady who drives this lead car in Uganda police. They normally even look at me. They say, you look, she's a woman, a woman, a woman. For them, it is new. But me, I'm now used. I'm proud of myself because I normally treat an important people for example, when Pope came to Uganda, there was the president of South Sudan, the wife of late Nyelele. She normally comes here every June for prayers. And so many people. There are several ways of looking at a woman in African culture. You can look at her as a mother, you can look at her as aunt. You can look at her as a sister and daughter. And also, of course, wife. We cannot talk about all women and put them in one block. We have to think about which woman we are talking about. Woman as mother is more valued. Woman as sister is dearer to the men within the community. But woman as wife, is coming from somewhere. She's just married. And uh, in my culture, the relationship is based on how much they've paid for the bride price. And she has to orient herself and suit and see how to negotiate her position within the community. But also, her position does not stay permanent. If she becomes a mother, she acquires a different status. If she becomes a mother of twins, she even gets another different status. So the woman as an identity is really influenced by several other uh, identities that merge to make her either to be valued or not to be valued. The moment a woman has children in the family, she's seen as the woman of that family. The girls in my family are seen as girls of the family. So there's a difference between the women of the family and the girls of the family. If you look at a woman as mother and by extension grandmother, you will realize that she's very much respected, very much loved, you can even say cherished. You look at her as a sister, more or less it is the same. But there is a way of looking at her as aunt. Here, uh, she becomes a figure authority. In fact, in some tribes, uh, they say that if you are cursed by your aunt, the curse will take you very far. There is, in fact, a very serious contradiction. Because the same society, which has proverbs and other things, which put down women generally, the same society really glorifies mothers. Motherhood is glorified. I think I haven't seen any African culture 
where a mother is not respected. I always wonder, how do they expect to protect mothers when they look down upon women generally? So I can't understand why they can't see that to protect the mothers or the mother image, they have to actually respect women in general. We have proverbs like, when a hen steps on a cheek, it does not kill. Meaning the mothers are, are too good. They can not kill, but maybe to train it or to put it right. It's like even when a mother beats you, it's not that they really want to hurt you, but they want to show you how to behave. Then there is a second proverb, Ngodambo Mao Okorotia. It says, if you don't have a mother, what do you do? So we add Otambula Mpola Notuka Kuizuli. That is, you, you, you just creep quietly and just recline by the veranda. There is a story told that uh, a woman conceived and gave birth. In the process of giving birth, she gave birth to a snake. And then, obviously, a snake is supposed to be killed. So the people who were there said, no, this has never happened. So they started hitting the snake. And as they hit the snake, she says, please hit with reservation. What comes out of the womb pains? Mutere Mpora. And so, when it comes to children being wayward, it's the mother who will endure, who will never give up. One proverb which says, A woman produces with the help of her co-wife. In other words, women are there to support each other. So if a woman gets labor pains any time of the night, the co-wife will be there to support her. The Chinese, they have a saying that the man is the head of the household, the woman is the neck that turns that head. You, you as an individual, you owe your identity to the mother. Yes, we are a patriarchal society, but why is, should it be that we look to the mother as the one who can determine that I belong to uh, this or the other father. I think it's the fact of, you know, carrying the child in your womb gives you a very strong attachment to that child, which the man does not have. If they don't respect their wife, they have a respect for their mothers. Mama. A mother uh, is at times described as the right hand. She's a woman and uh, even the word that is used for her is not in the feminine category of words. They put it in the masculine category and they call, call her sekono. And uh, all women will become mothers in a sense, they become sekono. In the Toro culture, a king does not rule alone. A king rules with his sister. Any king ascending to the throne has to have a sister who is a kind of a point of reference, who is a kind of advisor. But besides this is the queen mother, Omugo. The queen mother is a very strong, powerful institution, traditionally. There is the queen mother who plays a very important role. He cannot perform as a king, as a kabaka, without those two women. In order to ensure that, you know, there's blue blood in the kabaka of our land, they, they can only guarantee that through the royalness of his mother. When children make a mistake, even now, they know they will have to negotiate with the mother. And they know the mother will negotiate for them with the father. When you look 
under the microscope and see what is going on within these homes, you'll find that uh, women have much more power than they're given credit for. The young men that who are now, you know, working and earning with their own young families, they look back and they really appreciate and, and see the power that their mom had in the family. When the children misbehave, the woman is blamed. But when they do good things, the men want to take the credit. The mother is the owner of the children because it's the mother who knows who the father of these children is. Ah, if there are many fathers or if there are many children. If your mother dies when she, he has, she has told you that this is your father, then close the chapter. Know that that is your father. A grandmother, a woman who is a grandmother is revered in the community. She's really respected. And she is given the benefit of wisdom of old age and valued. The children trust her. They go to her. The young people respect her because she will give you porridge and you will know there is no problem eating in her family, eating in her homestead. I think age brings some new dynamics to gender. Older women take on this new role as grandmothers, as, as, as carers of their husbands, as they just take on this new powerful role that they may not have enjoyed before. Every woman who has passed a certain age, maybe 60 and above, they become icons in their actions, in their relationships, in the networks that they have created in the communities. They even go as far as telling her secrets that the, their mothers don't, don't know. Usually she's a wise woman and she's one who is well rooted in the culture and many times uh, she is um, respected in the whole village. Sometimes she's even a herbalist that she knows some medicines. My, my grandmother was a herbalist and and we used it to say, hey, Mukaka, when you die, we will suffer. Many people use it to pass going to see Mukaka Merav. The woman is the most single, most important aspect that connects communities. By the time the colonialists came, from what I have, what I gather is, you know, patriarchy had consolidated itself. They came from Victorian Europe and what was pertaining in Victorian Europe at that time was what we can describe as classic patriarchy, what was pertaining here as negotiable patriarchy in that although men ruled and men dominated, women had a say and women were not fully dependent on men. If you really excavate and look behind the scenes and dig deep, you find that women have had a lot of power and a lot of say, and they were consulted. So, so that, you know, the line that divided the so-called public sphere from the so-called private sphere was very blurred at the time. <music> As soon as you get married, the people in the family are observing, looking for signs of pregnancy. What they want is children, they want grandchildren. The only unfortunate bit is that they always looked at the woman as the source of failure to have children. If you only have girls, the girls are going to get married and go to another family. And that means there is no hair. You must do whatever it takes you have to have a child. A man who could not have children, that would be taken care of very easily. All they had to do once they discover they can, was to, you know, make use of their brothers. The resultant children will become his, literally. That was not a problem, but of course for women, the, the, the stigma was um, sharper for women than it was, but men could disguise it. If you don't have a choice, if you don't have a say in, um, your, your husband's brothers, your husband's father having sex with you, then obviously that's oppression. 
the moment you have only daughters and there is no son, you are blamed for it. They do not have the sense of, you know, the Y chromosomes and X chromosomes. The blame is put on the women. Now, as the men do this, unconsciously they are really trying to, to, to really mention the fact that these children belong to the women. My mom gave birth to five of us girls. The experience I have is that as far as uh, responsibilities are concerned, my parents played their roles. The people around us, especially the relatives, who undermined, despised us because we were girls. They used to call my, my dad names for paying fees for us because they, girls are supposed to bring in uh, wealth, not wasting money on paying their fees. But I thank God that my father had uh, some education and he was able to say, no, my children, these girls are going to be different. And from time to time, he would encourage us. He said, my dear children, the world is not favorable for you as women. And I'm giving you the weapon to face the world, and that is the pen. I have three, three daughters. The, the story has been the same. You know, those comments of only girls, no hair, and so on. For me, I was not ready to wait and hear all those insults because I reached a point where I realized that the father of my children and their relatives did not see any sense in their relationship where there is no son. My parents wedded when I was a little grown. And as the preparations for the wedding was going on, there was a lot of talk. Why should you wed a woman who has given birth to only girls? There is no hair. And by wedding her, you are now limiting yourself. It means you cannot have another woman and have sons. And that is what I also faced. You know, from university, of course, I jumped into the relationship. Did not bother about church and so on. Now, the issue of children came in. Now, when I had the children, I thought, okay, now, why don't you put this rightly, my God, so that I return to the sacraments. My issue was the sacraments. Now the question came, you are demanding to be wedded. That means our son cannot have another woman. And yet there is no son here. So I said, okay, let him go and make the sons as I return to the sacraments. If it was not that, surely the girls should be seen as wealth because they, when they get married, they bring in wealth. Senga literally means paternal aunt. Among the Baganda, this paternal aunt is an institution in and of itself. It was the role and the duty of the paternal aunt to prepare females from a very young age, groom them and mold them to become good, responsible women. The aunt is the one who gives to girls a sex education because she has real authority in her own home because she's already grown up, but also in the homes of her brothers. And when there are decisions to be made on the children, the aunt should be there. In fact, among the Baganda, the aunt accompanies uh, her niece to the home on the wedding day and she has to stay there for some days should the bride be a virgin the goat is given to the aunt as a kind of token of honor and thanksgiving there is a saying that senga singa te yali mukazi yandibadde musajja yandibadde tata when you're referred to as a senga, your role changes from you as being a wife. As a wife, you are silent. As a senga, you hold the, the power of deciding how is our bloodline going to be. The role of the aunt is so important that even in modern life, you see, uh, it is kept even if it is in a different way. Many singers today in this quote-unquote modern times have become very coy. They're too shy to talk to their nieces about sexuality, for example. So 
to fill that gap um commercialized singer have come up you could call them the modern sexologists in matrimonial societies the structure of the society is is different the one who would play the role of the aunt in fact is is called mother the sister of my mother is not my aunt she is my mother as the brother of my father is not uh, my uncle he is my father in malawi and zambia when they go for initiation we call it namwali there the girls are taught how to go about the house chores they are taught they are given real sex education in great great details they are told the story of their tribe and the ethics of their tribe there are some societies that don't have initiation for boys it is only for girls and now in the modern times the initiation of boys is slowly slowly disappearing but the one of girls is very very important even if they are in town by the way they will be taken back to the village for initiation a girl is the one most empowered in our culture in our society a girl will be even given skills on how to take control not manipulate take control and manage the husband so much of the preparation is really concentrated on the woman so in our culture no effort is put on men the man is a wild seed which is just thrown there to germinate and weather the storms of life men do not have particular rituals specific rituals that they like the women had a woman was brought into the family of the man and she had to be initiated but for the man he was the one bringing the woman and there was no particular rite of passage that the lange had for the boys for tribes that is circumcised especially those that circumcise both men and women man meaning a human being is born in androgyny meaning he is neither sexually determined as a woman or as a man so what do they do they will cut away from the man what they think is feminine and that is the foreskin and they are going to cut away from the woman what they think is masculine that is the clitoris but by extension especially those who go as far as even cutting the labia they want to decrease the sexual instinct and even pleasure in a woman so that she may not be um tempted to commit adultery these societies they have got groups you have got the young people the children you have got the adolescents who mainly who are warriors and you have got the elders who lead the society now these warriors who are young men married they are always armed and many times they're not even at home if the women have this tendency to seek sexual pleasure certainly they are going to go with the men that are available but then the weapons that should face the enemy will now face one who is even a relative if the part of the pleasure is cut away maybe the temptation will be less then there is even another thing it is one way of preparing women to endure very much for example childbirth but also sometimes to stay at home and look after children despite the cruelty of the husband meaning that for them they see a kind of value in suffering because circumcision whether male or female is very painful very painful for men 
they would like to create a group of warriors who are not afraid, who are courageous and can fight. But for women, they want to prepare women who are going to endure the hardships of society. I found something similar. This is uh, the elongation of the lips. It is done among the Baganda as part of the initiation and also among the Lomwe. They think that it will increase the, the pleasure, both of the men and of the women. In pre-colonial Lao culture, we had rituals that welcomed the woman into the family. There would be the process of marriage where you'd take your bride price, the first money to go and ask for the hand of the woman and you'd place in the hands of the mother. And the, the mother would give this money to the daughter. So it's not just the, the girl who has to like the husband. The woman, the mother sanctions this by accepting and passing on the money to the daughter. So after this process, maybe another gift is taken and then the girl can now be allowed to go and visit the boy's family. But the process of accepting her into the boy's family, there's another ritual when she's expecting a child. And for a whole day, she has to carry out the wifely duties. And all through, she's just putting on a small loin cloth, which is made of animal skin. And she's moving with her brother's in-law. The whole idea of the nakedness is for the whole clan to see. This is what we are bringing in. It's believed that once they perform this ritual on you, you belong to this clan. You are a wife of the clan, and the, the oil that they smear on you makes you belong to the clan. For you to, to, to get married in another clan, they have to wash out all the oil. Tueyolao, which literally refers to the tying of the small strip of skin that covers the private parts is looked at as a celebration of womanhood because this woman is now being married, she's being accepted into the clan because she's expecting a child. Now this, from a cultural point of view, is a celebration of womanhood and it's a joy for all the clan members to know that we have an additional member in the clan and she's going to continue to give us continuity and produce children. With the coming of Christianity in Lao, this practice was stopped. Why make a woman walk the whole day naked? A woman who fetches a lot of bride price is a woman who is considered hardworking. A woman who knows how to cook good food. A woman who is beautiful. The word price just looks at that transactional value. It doesn't consider these nuances of lives being situated and located and given origin somewhere. If a man pays bride price and separates with the woman and the woman goes back to the uh, father's home and he does not go to collect his bride price, then this woman goes back and produces children. These children are considered to be his children. If they refund the bride price and then you can have children and have other men, if you are not married, those children belong to your father. These days we hear a lot of gender-based violence, domestic violence. It's not that it just started now. There used to be violence in communities, but they were regulated. The man in his patriarchal authority would try to lord over the woman, but the clan would not allow him. If a man beats his wife all the time, the clan would call him and discipline him and beat him up. That was the, a kind of accepted, acceptable discipline. If a woman was disrespectful and it was hard maybe that he was, she was having affairs, with uh, the brothers-in-law or with someone, this woman would also be invited before the clan and she would be, they would discuss the issue and they would also discipline her. And in most cases, her discipline did not just stop at the clan level. They would make sure that her parents get to know that she's misbehaving and then the parents would have to pay a fine. The clan system was very, very instrumental in maintaining and regulating this patriarchal authority.
there is anybody in the family who for no reason whatsoever decides to remain single, it is not tolerated because culturally there is no place for such a person. A woman is a fountain of life. Therefore, a woman must be able to bear children and continue with the family life. We have a three strata uh, understanding of, of life. We have life here on earth. Then we have the world of the spirits and beyond them, the life of the supreme being, Katonda, God, the one who created. Now we need connection to all of these levels. And uh, giving life, passing on life, ensures that these things are going to go on. In a situation where you, your husband dies, you, they arrange. Normally, a, a brother or a cousin takes over. She's taken over because she got married, she got integrated into this cycle of, uh, of friends and family members that somebody else can uh, take her over. I think the Madi were very wise to really think of it this way that there must always be a, a father figure in a home. Where there is no father figure, it reaches a level where the boys will not listen to their mother and many of them get, get really destroyed or spoiled. The girls sometimes even become worse, they will look at you as a woman like them. What are you telling you? You're a woman like, like me. Parenthood. Uh, whereby somebody as a woman is raising up children, we sort of feel that that child is going to have an imbalance in his or her psychological and cognitive development. Because uh, contributory factors to this type of development should come from two sides. One masculine, one of a man, the other feminine. Women could be understandably single in my culture. For instance, if they were shrine virgins, at times if they are married, let's say, to some late king, the singleness, which is not usually accepted, is the singleness of men. In a situation where now women think, I don't see any man to marry, let me have a child without a man, they go for artificial insemination. There, I really don't know what is going to happen. Because the issue of identity, who is your father? But it's coming up today because women are able to do things on their own. Although in some situations you may find this woman is unable to have children, yes, but the, the man loves his wife and will really be so protective that this woman remains in the home. A mother is a person who has been brought into the homestead. In the event where you are married and you do not have your own children for biological reasons, the home still values you. You are still held as a mother of a home. Because there are other children in that home who have lost their mothers. When she's in that child, which is not a kind word for women, she is seen as somebody who does not belong to anyone and belongs to everybody at the same time. I think that that term, Nachiyondekede, may be a little bit modern. Um, if that situation where a woman wasn't supposed to go and find her own space and develop a home. We have generally lost trend of our cultural obligation. So we have thrown out all those values which used to hold families together. The community and even the Kilan had the power to chastise those men and call them to order. If they were not behaving the way the community or the, the clan expected them to, so they also wouldn't go to excesses. Because now men are individuals. So if a man is really violent, nobody touches him. He can even abuse the clan if they call him. He can even refuse to go there with impunity. What we need as a community is to go back and find out when the shift started happening, and it's very unfortunate because we didn't catch it. I think that was 
a better community that we live in, a community that respected the man's contribution and the woman's contribution. When I grew up, there was nothing so individualistic, like this is mine. We all knew that the land that we farmed belonged to us. It belonged to my father, but also it belonged to my mother, it belonged to all of us. There wasn't a lot of property, and the property that was most important there was land. Well, I think for my mothers and for our grandmothers, there wasn't that much of a demand and need for this individuality. These are people who used to value their wealth, their cattle and their farms. But slowly with time it started changing. Why? Because money came in this in it all. The men would move from family from family to family doing their work communally but expecting payment, food and so on. Now because of that, the men eventually withdrew from playing their role in the family. The women started taking over the role of the, of the men. They now started going to dig the heavy grass which was meant for men. And slowly, the women have taken over. And I think that's why the men left the villages, the farmland in the hands of the women and moved out to see how they can make ends meet. And men all of a sudden find that their roles that used to be taking care of animals, the value that they used to attach to these animals, which they could sell and get uh, money to send their children to school, is all not there anymore. There is no single work where a woman cannot do. Women are like men these days. Most ladies out there, they only know how to sit in the car and they drive. The only thing they know from a car is to see the gauge. When it is showing red, they will know there is no fuel. And in case of any minor thing whereby you can handle as a lady, as a driver, you find someone say, oh, I'm stuck on the road, can you come and help me? Every morning, before you start a car, you must check the oil level. That one is very, very important. You check the water level. That's, you check the tire. Is, it, is the pressure okay? Most of women these days, these hard-working women, you find most of them are single mothers. And with the growing population, some have moved away to the cities, others have remained behind. So men are finding it hard to adjust. You find in most urban areas, men are seated around uh, the tables and playing cards. But the women, because of the roles, the child will come crying to you if there's no food on the table. So the, the women are taking up much more extra roles, roles that are considered non-feminine and trying to make a living. But if you find a man who has been socialized the traditional way of keeping the woman's space safe and not stepping in the kitchen, he will not want to come to the kitchen and feel that he's interfering. But again also, things change. What if now your wife is not there and the house girl is not there? And the demands of the moment is that there has to be food on the table. So things are changing. The gender relations are changing depending on now the demand and the requirement of the moment. Uh, working women are torn between paying attention to the role of mothering and staying at home, nurturing and taking care of everything to the extent that we have to get someone to help us to take care of the children. So you balance between your work and the domestic work at home. 
my children they like my job at first they used not to like it because i can go and finish like five days i'm out but when i'm coming back i come in a heavy way i carry chicken i carry bread i carry this i carry this and now they know when mom is getting out at least and this is where i i get their school fees from i support them and they really like it and they encourage me i also miss them but we are not used working women now are faced with the challenge of um the modern times where you have to have your own property registered in your own name and you're responsible for it. I have my own car, my husband has his own car. And therefore, when it comes to the question of ownership of property in marriage, then we begin interpreting it using also what we've learned from Western and feminist perspectives. And also looking at the value of owning something because you need to own something if you want to go and get a loan from the bank and i see that men will be required to take up some of the roles that they considered feminine and women are already taking up some of the roles that are considered masculine that are considered for the men because of the demands of the times they can't stand women like us these days the pattern is that when the man brings a second wife or a third wife now there is a really chaos. The first wives are even driven away very miserably, thrown out. Even if they would have contributed to building the house, they throw her out. These days it is really painful. Women are working double, triple, quadruple shifts. Because by the economic situation in the home becoming very difficult and forcing women, because of you know, loss of animals, retrenchment, whatever it is, retrenchment of husbands and so on, from the civil service and so on. Um, she has to go out and make some money. It doesn't matter whether it is in the informal sector, whether she's selling pancakes, banana leaves, whatever it is, she gets out of the home to work. But that does not mean that her traditional work within the home becomes any less. Today, you can find a woman earning more than the man. But that can also be quite challenging in the relationships. Because in our mental makeup, we've been told that ma the man is the bread earner, the hunter, the gatherer for the family. So it kind of diminishes the role. And so many times today, you find that there is competition. If a man uh, is married to a woman who is highly educated, there is the fear and therefore the desire to control the woman. It's quite challenging, but it's just a matter of understanding your partner. But once you communicate, me, I don't care whether I'm calling at four, whether I'm calling at midnight, whether I'm calling at what. So long as I'm talking to my baby and he's building confidence in me, makes him very happy and very comfortable. Today you will find little girls and boys in primary school being taught as part of the curriculum that the father is the head of the family. You're telling, you, you're telling a, a little boy being raised by his single mother that the head of your family is a man. What better way to entrench patriarchy? They still have that cultural belief that if a woman is not married, there is no male figure in your life. It's tragic. So that is why even very educated women who don't need that woman, they, in every way they take care of him. Women are taking up much more burden, much more role of taking care of the children, especially in the era of absentee fathers. But also men who do not have women who are of working class are also stressed with having to take care of the children with wives who are not working. There is some empowerment, but then there is also that tragic side that the women are very accommodating. They have remained, they have kept that stereotype 
that they are naturally caring, they are naturally what, they, you know, they take care of everybody. She will really even almost drop dead, but she has to do everything because she has just strictly taken that cultural upbringing so seriously. You know, when you are talking to them, you know, you don't have to suffer this or that. Alice, you are speaking like a man. <laughs> I have to put up with all that. They don't understand me and I don't understand them. Separation, divorce used not to be that much. Why are we having a lot of breakup, family breakup? The state, the political uh, institutions right now, these are still basically very masculinist, where women are looked at as not belonging. There's also the gendered socialization, where as she comes in, she's always reminded of her place as a woman. This reminder is not coming from men only. Even women who have digested and accepted patriarchy and have not questioned the way they think, always try to tell the other women remind women of their place. You know, there are times when you as a woman, you feel empowered. You feel power within. You feel, you know, you, you, you actually practice agency. You act on things that you want to do and feel. But it is the patriarchal society that, you know, hovers over you and presses you down and, you know, puts you literally in your place. Without any doubt, my mother is in charge now of my family. But when the priest visits, when census enumerators go, they immediately, you know, be lying to my father because he's the man in a patriarchy. He is the one. Mukari Bukari is just a woman. And even the woman herself, because of socialization, she will say, Is it the Mukari Bukari? Is it the Mukari Nkara? I'm a mere woman. You know, they, they have got it into their heads. So they are saying it's like those. Very mean. In our culture, woman, you are taught, accept that your husband is tall. Even if you are rich, accept that your husband is richer. When it comes to buying land, okay, they are family, happily married, but he doesn't have enough to buy land. In fact, it is she who has the money to buy land. But when they go to buy that land, she will hand over the money to him, okay? before they get to the, the, the seller of the land. So that, you know, to, to save appearances, to show this is all about performance, appearances, so that it appears as if he is the one buying, he is the one in charge. And she accepts that the title deed will be put in his names as head of the family. And of course, 15 years down the road, when the, um, the marriage hits the rocks, then that becomes an issue. It's in his names. She paid. It's in his names. She's telling him that is my house, that is my land. He's saying, the law says, let's look at the title deed. No, it is his. So, you know, so many women are going through this. What advice can the women who are facing the challenges of nurturing and taking care of their children alone, what can they learn? from their grandmothers. What are some of the things that men can learn about uh, who a real man is? You're at university together. You're in Africa Hall. You've gotten yourself a boyfriend in Micho. And you go to wash in Micho. You go to wash clothes. You go to set up his room in Micho. So how do you expect him tomorrow when he marries you? How do you expect him to watch for himself? How do you expect him to set up 
because you started it. You started it right at university. There's a girl I respect, she's a lawyer, and we were talking about marriage. And she said, ah, me, I, I, I don't think I really want to marry a poor man. She's a lawyer. Her parents paid school fees. She has studied and finished up to that level. You're still looking for someone to look after you. Really? A man will also say, ah, uh -uh, I want a woman who will look after me. So what will happen to our society? You know, we, we may focus on the oppression of women, but patriarchy also oppresses men. You know, the expectations on a man emotionally, physically, financially, can, can take a toll on men. We must take a step backwards. In politics, women didn't have to struggle for these places. This is coming straight from the cultures. Difference does not necessarily mean someone is incapable or someone has to be discriminated against. If government can go beyond thinking about making women to be represented in terms of numbers, but think about the quality of women and the mindset that looks at women as you know people who are not able just because they belong to this biological category that's different, then we shall reach that equilibrium. We should be actually be looking at the presidency. The society is as strong as the weakest individual family. The family is as strong as the father is. But the father's strength is most effective where the mother is and so the mother is at the core of the whole society. The mother is the neck. The mother is the neck, making sure the head and the rest of the family connect. This is a powerful role we cannot afford to disrespect, we need to introspect. Our very existence is a fruit of our mother's will and strength. To say that a woman and the earth are the same is truth. They both can turn seed into a plant bearing fruit. Like that song by Rema Namakula. Singasi muchala, singense no yakoma. If it wasn't for a woman, yeah, this world would be over. You do not have to be a sage to fully fathom the strength of a woman. Just analyze any African traditional society and you will find that it heavily depends on a woman. So much that we even began to call it the motherland, Mama Africa, Mama Africa. The languages we speak are mother tongues and who do you think is our teacher? Mothers are the custodians of our heritage and they pass it down onto us, the next generation, so they must be crowned. Yes, they must be crowned. They are the delicate connection between our present and our future. They are best positioned to pass down tradition and culture. And what is any society without its culture? Dead. So we, men of the present, need to treat our women as a gift. Because when you mistreat a woman, the society's degeneration is made swift. We, men, of the present need to treat our women as a gift because when you mistreat a woman the society's degeneration is made swift when you mistreat a woman the society's degeneration is made swift when you mistreat a woman the society's degeneration is made swift, made swift.